Be bold. Be heard. Welcome to Unmute Your Mic with your host, Jessica Bell. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Unmute Your Mic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unmute Your Mic. My name is Jessica Bell. I am your host. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, as always, and I'm so excited for you all to hear today's guest. I have Marty Ray Project with me. He is from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm just excited to get to learn and know everything about him, meet new people as you guys are uh, figuring him out. So am I. And so I'm very excited um, to just get to talking. And Marty, if you could just introduce yourself and just let us know a little bit about you. Well, everybody always says introduce yourself. And the only thing I can do is just tell you that I was put here by God to sing and write songs. And some people like them. Some people don't. I just keep doing that. And, uh, and, he, and now, you know, he's, he's actually expanded my horizons into acting and writing and other things. But whatever it has to do with entertainment, whatever whatever I'm supposed to do, I'll do it. That's kind of all I can say about myself. I'm a hard, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. I love barbecue, as you can tell. If you're looking at <laughs> if you're watching this, you can definitely tell by looking at me that I love barbecue. <laughs> and uh, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, raised in Arkansas. Now I live in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a little short little introduction of Marty Ray Project. Well, thank you. And I appreciate that. And so I guess I'll just get right into it with the questions. You said that you were put here uh, to be an entertainer, to do music. When did you first figure that out? I think I knew that from a young child. I think think we all really know what we're going to do and supposed to do from a young child. We're just trained to not believe it. If you if you think about being a, a kid, you you can make believe and pretend that you're anything, and people can tell you that you can be anything, and you'll believe it. And there's no nobody can tell you any different. You you act like you're a superhero, and you are a superhero. But then as you grow up, you're trained. Well, that's not really realistic. You need to grow up, and all these things. So you're trained to not believe it. So the same thing that happens to everybody else happened to me. I was trained to not really believe it that it that I was put here to sing that I could sing, that I could create a career in that and in other things that involve entertainment. But it was always looked at as an unrealistic thing, uh, uh, just a a dream that where I was raised, you were were taught to dream within your four walls. And then if you dreamed outside of that, you were taught to dream within your city limits. So you never were taught to go, okay, even in, even in school that I grew up in, you were taught to, you were kind of molded to want to crave a job at a steel mill. You, this is where like the steel mill, cause the steel mill is a great job. And where I grew up in Arkansas, it's a place called new core and you could make $150,000 a year, some of those jobs. So it was a good job and it was, a, and it still is, but to train a child that this is your future, this is what you should think your future is going to be, this is what you should dream to be and aspire to be, is uh, foolish to me because that means the creativity is gone now. There's nothing wrong with people doing that. Somebody somebody needs to do that, and it's very respectable, the ones that do it. But it wasn't for me. You know, it wasn't what God put me here to do. I, my mama, I always say my mama said, when I cried as a baby, it sounded like a song. So I don't know. I can't remember being a baby, but I just take her word for it and go from there. And I love what you said. Like um, when we're children, we do have the ability to just dream big. And it's kind of disappointing that as we get older, we're kind of taught to be realistic. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I know you want to be an astronaut, but what do you really want to do? You know, and so I think that's a great point that you pointed out. And that leads me, I guess, to the question of like, how did you uh, keep your dream alive, per se? Because I know I have a lot of people who follow my platform who have dreams and it kind of just has a slow start or they're kind of forced to be realistic to, you know, pay bills or that kind of thing. So how did you keep your dream alive? 
I don't think my dream was kept alive at all. I believe it was, it was, as I said before, my, I had family members. I always, I have family members even today that they could sing and play music and write songs. And they did those things in church. And I always looked up to them and I thought, man, I'd love to do what they do. And I would sing with them at Christmas time and things like that, looking for some kind of adulation from them, some kind of praise saying you, you're very, you're good. You should go after this, but never gotten it. And I never got it at all. I actually got the exact opposite most of the time. Whereas they would be, you know how you, you have this thing that you, whatever the creative thing that you do, you have this thing. And even a podcast like this, I actually have a podcast as well. So I know that when you make a podcast, you want, you send it to somebody and you, you might say, Hey, check this out. What do you think? And if they go, Hmm, that's all right. It, and you, you go off of that reaction, it can crush you. Like if you're not careful, it'll crush you. So for years that actually did crush me. I would send, I would sing for them or, or send a song to them and, and they would go, huh, needs a little work or hmm, this, that's all right. Maybe you should look into playing an instrument if you want to get into music and not be a singer. And I was like, you know, that just, that just crushed me because my thought, my dream, my purpose was to sing because I was always doing it. And it what it's what made me feel good to do. And they trained that out of me to, to made me think that, okay, this is just a hobby that maybe, maybe I'm one of these people that hear their self and they, they sound good to themselves, but everybody else, they sound like crap to. So that's for years. That's what I thought until I got a, uh, I believe it was in 2005. I got my first MacBook and it had garage band on it. So for the first time I was able for free to start recording myself and making some music. And we did that. And in my cousin, it was me and my cousin, we were in the church one Christmas, uh, we were just messing around and we were trying to, uh, do a song called hallelujah with him and me doing the harmonies and things like that. Everybody knows the song. And that song never got finished back then, but it was getting, we were getting ready to leave. And I said, well, I want to do one song, get something done so that I can kind of play with it and mix it and learn. And I said, let me pick a song that I've never heard before, because up until that point I had been, I had been mimicking people like other artists. Like that's kind of what I did. So if it was Ray Charles, I mimicked him. If it was, if it was uh, Al Green, I mimicked him or, or Garth Brooks or whoever it was. I was literally training myself. I don't know to, to sound like them and there's no market for somebody that sounds like somebody else. So that day, that night, I said, I'm going to pick a song in here that I've never heard anybody sing. And I picked a song called great speckled bird. And he played it and I sang it. And it was the first time ever that I had heard my voice from by myself. So it was like God. And I had chills that day when I was singing. So I was like, here it is. This is the, I'm going to see, I think this is it. And I made a video and I put the video out and it got like 30,000 views on Facebook. And I thought, Hey, I'm famous. You know, I'm famous now it's over. It's all said and done, but that wasn't the case. I wasn't famous and, uh, still aren't still ain't. I'll say ain't. I think that's a word now. <laughs> Listen, and I love what you said, because when the talking about having to be original, like you said, you hadn't really heard yourself as you and just kind of like you said, there's no market if you're just trying to be somebody else. And I think that's a word right there, because a lot of us are trying to kind of get in where we fit in. But we're trying to kind of model ourselves after somebody and say, oh, I want to be the next so and so and so i think that's very powerful to make that statement like until you were really able to walk into what god had for you you couldn't really you weren't really going to tap into what it is that you were specifically called to do um and i know you said you ain't famous but ain't. you definitely have um you definitely have a following and people who are hearing your voice. And so can I just ask you what were some of the steps? So I know you like recorded and you started posting videos, but along the way, what were some things you kind of had to do or adjust to kind of continue further walking in your specific calling? Well, I'll tell you the truth. This is a, I'll try to sum this up as quickly as possible. Cause I know you only have 30 minutes here, but the, uh, along the way, after that first video, I was still working for my father 
as a mechanic and he owned a business. He still owns a business. And uh, we were in Blyville, Arkansas. <clears throat> and I had made that uh, great speckled bird video. And there was a lot of people calling the shop and, and they were not my family. They were calling my, the shop and saying, man, that, that really moved me. That was great. And this and that, and, you know, so then you start to get this, this head of steam that builds up and you say, man, maybe I should do something. Then people start asking when you're going to make an album, things like that. And you say, wow, <clears throat> I never really thought about that. And so it's like, God starts pushing you. And whereas there's no, never a truer scripture than when you're trying to be creative, then when Jesus said a prophet is not without honor, save in his own city, in his own house, because that means wherever you, I never did get any, I'm not saying my parents didn't, didn't support me, but my dad was a man who worked for everything he got. So he wasn't one that was, he wasn't a dreamer per se. He was a, he was a worker and that's the way he was raised. And my mom was raised the same way. How be it? She, she still encouraged me, but she never said you, you're going to make it big in, in music or you're going to this, you'll make money doing this. She never said I couldn't, but she never said I would either or that I could. She was the same as, as my father and they were trained to, to look at life as here's how you make money. You work with these hands and that's the way you do it. And that's, that's admirable. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not knocking any of that, but with me, as soon as that happened, I took the last $3,000 that I had in the bank. And I said, if it's, if it's something that I'm supposed to do, then I'll find out. So I took that last bit of money out of the bank account, borrowed my uncle's van, drove to Nashville, slept in the back of the van, uh, booked the studio with, with my buddy CJ Wilder, who plays with me today. Um, we, we recorded four songs for an EP tow truck driver, uh, a song called country man. Cause, and then, uh, two more songs. I remember, oh, uh, boots and, and paper. That's what they were called. And, uh, cause back then, you know, I thought, well, I look like I'm country. People think I'm a country music singer. So I guess I better be a country music singer when in all reality, I grew up, even now people think that, but I grew up listening to Boys to Men and Al Green and, and Ray Charles and those people, those are the people that I, I, I aspired to sound like and be like. So, but I, I said, well, if they think I'm country, I should be country. For a long time, I, I did that. And uh, not now, but I still like country music. But anyway, so I made this album. It wasn't getting very much love. It wasn't getting no attention, even from the people that, were calling and saying I should make an album. I still wasn't getting attention from it. So then I said, well, I will, I'll start going and taking this album to people that have already made it in music. And so I thought, well, maybe this will get me some attention. And little did I know that other artists that have already made it, they're not interested in helping other artists. That's, it's a very selfish industry for the most part. And that goes, that goes, I think that's the same for all entertainment in, in, in that regard. Most of the time it's, it's, if you're an actor, you're not really looking to help other actors. Most of the time people aren't. And same with music. Now I'm not that way. I don't want to be that way. And I pray that I never am. But the fact is that God literally sent legends to lift me up at my lowest times. This is crazy. This is going to sound unbelievable, but this is actually true. And I've told this story many times. So if anybody's listening that knows me, they'll know the story. I was giving my album to these artists that I thought would listen, and none of them would listen. And then I went to a B.B. King concert. And I went to this B.B. King concert, and I was on the front row, and he was playing music, and I was just sitting there vibing, you know, just jamming and uh, listening to him. And he stops the show. In the middle of the show, he says, hold on, everybody, hold on. And he said, looks right at me and he says as long as that man right there is having a good time so am i and he goes nah, 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 nah. thrill is gone away and i was like whoa whoa man i was just like we just couldn't hardly speak and i, I thought why did he point me out at all these people because he could see the whole the whole crowd because he had he made the the people uh, that were running the place turned the house lights all the way up as if he was playing in our living room. So it was, it was essentially that. And so that was enough already, but I had the privilege to be able to go backstage and meet him with about 50 other people. And 
they after the show they're leading us on down this narrow little hallway type area behind the stage on the side of the stage and they're they're leading us with a flashlight and there's this row of security guards and they're standing there and we're walking by and you can't hardly see nothing besides what's in this this uh, flashlight and at the time this was when bb was already in a wheelchair and so we're walking by and all these people walk by and then this hand comes out this big hand comes out from uh, between these security guards and grabs my hand and is pulling me towards these security guards and I'm, I'm, I'm getting pulled over and they're saying, you got to move along. What are you doing? And I said, somebody has got a hold of my hand and they part ways and it's BB King. He's got my hand and he pulled me up to him and he looks up at me. He's in that wheelchair and he says, I want you to know I enjoyed having you tonight. And I'm sitting there going, why, <laughs> what, the, why is this happening to me? I was like, I want you to know that I love you. You know what I mean? Like I, I love you, BB. And he, I had, uh, which is on my wall right now. I had a poster and I had my, uh, my BB King album. And he, uh, he said, what well, we got here. And he looks at it and, uh, he signs it. He says, I'll see you back there. So again, if that stopped right there, it was already amazing, but I'll wait in line. I have a Martin guitar and my Martin guitar had, I think one signature on it. Cause I, I didn't really know how to play at the time. I was, I was uh, getting signatures from people that I admired so that it would, forced me to play i thought well if they signed it if you get a bb king signature on your guitar you got to be able to play it some at, in some capacity so bb was contractually obligated to only sign gibson guitars so i had a martin he wasn't supposed to sign it he, i was watching as he was turning away what those people were saying were family they said they were his family they were turning away people that didn't have gibson guitars i saw him walk out without an autograph so I'm I'm walking in. I'm the very last one. I, I made sure I was the last one. And as I'm watching, you can see in the green room, excuse me, you can see in the green room as BB's getting just tired. He's getting more and more tired. And he's but he's always he's such a such a wonderful man, was a wonderful man. He was he was an absolute king, and that's for sure. The reason he was called king was because he loved his fans so much. He uh he he was, you could see him like they would come in he was just really drained and he would, he would smile and take the picture and he would do this. And you could just see it in his face where he was, he was tired. But at the very end, I walk in and when I walk in, he lights up again. Like, it's just like, he got a, this burst of energy and I come in, he goes, Hey, my friend, come on like this. And it, again, I don't know why. And the only thing I can tell you is that it was God telling me, Using a legend such as B.B. King to say, you got better things to do. Keep going. Because when I came over, I walked over my guitar. This is a Martin, of course. And he looks up at the head of it. He sees his Martin. He looks up at me and he goes, I'm going to sign it anyway. And he signed that. And then I pulled for the very last thing that B.B. King, B.B. King did that just left a lasting impact on me. And really, to this day, keeps me going is I, I took my that album that I just mentioned earlier. I took that album out of my out of my jacket and I handed it to him and he looks at it and he goes, he said, Who's who's got that Sharpie? And I thought he wanted me, I thought he thought I wanted him to sign it. And I was like, no, no, that's for you. He said, I know who this is for. And he said, Who's got that Sharpie? And they brought the Sharpie back over to him. And he hands it to me and he says, sign this to BB King. And I signed my first album ever to BB King. So I left that day on the biggest high in the world, knowing that that this that, that God had to make He had to orchestrate that. There's no other. I've never met BB King in my life before. Then there's no other explanation besides God intervening and saying, "I'm going to lift you up with some legends." And he BB King wasn't the only one. But again, we only have so much time here. If you are just now tuning in, my name is Jessica Bell and you are listening to Unmute Your Mic. And I am currently talking to Marty Ray Project. He is from Nashville, Tennessee, and we are talking about navigating the music industry and following your God-given purpose. Keep watching now. Listen, that story is amazing for so many reasons. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Just him pointing you out in the audience would have been amazing right there right and i think what you said was so good like god knows when you need him to send somebody to just give you that extra 
boost of encouragement or, you know, if you were thinking about quitting, like now you can't, you know? Right. And so, and I've, and and I've thought I, about quitting a lot, you know? Yeah. And then I also love the fact that he did it so blatantly. Like it could have just yeah. been a little nudge, but he just kept going on and on to let you know, like you are being seen. I, I hear you and I need you to keep going. And that is something that's so beautiful because you can hang on to that for the rest of your life. That story, that moment, and then other moments as well, have literally kept me going throughout many situations for sure. That I know that God looked down. He said, "This is what I have for you. Continue, continue, continue." That's what he. That's what he said. He, and because every time I would get low and start to, even after that BB King, you would think that would leave that would leave you up forever. But you still get low sometimes, even after that. It's the same as the the uh, the the Israelites when they were being led out of the 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 uh, uh, e Egypt. They saw all these amazing things, but there was still a time when they said, "Make us a golden calf." You know. But the point is, I'm not that I'm making a golden calf. I don't want that to be thought. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there was times when I got low, and and then Charlie Daniels was another one that tweeted about my my album. Said it, I listened it rocks. And I was like, wow, Charlie Daniels. I don't, you know who Charlie Daniels is, right? He just passed away too, RIP. He, 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 then again, I had no fans at this point. Not one fan, not one reason for any, for any of these legends to lift me up, but they continued to do it. And that, that kept me going until I did get, gain some traction with my, with getting my own fans. And then now my fans lift me up and it's really special. And that's such a, that, so much of that is beautiful. And I think that's a constant reminder that a lot of us need to know that, you know, when God has ordained us to do something, he will make things happen that just, you know, in your wildest dreams, you couldn't have said like, oh, this person's going to tweet me or he's going to pull me out of a, of, in a concert. Like, because sometimes, especially I know doing podcasting or starting anything from the ground up, you can sometimes feel very small and like you're a very small fish in a huge lake. And so, or a huge ocean, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so that's really inspirational for me. And so I guess I would want to ask you as well, like what is some advice or some things that you can tell the person who has just started something, whether it's they want to be a musician, whether it's podcasting, like you said, you had your own podcast, but what is a, what is something that you would tell that person who is just starting and they find it maybe even more difficult than they thought it would be? Well, to, to talk about a podcast is that we'll put it in podcast perspective, seeing as though we are on a podcast. And I do podcasts as well. So the, actually before before I ever started doing music, I was doing a podcast. In 2007, I did a podcast. And uh, because I knew that this was the future of radio. And I remember there was a, a, no, no statistics or anything back then. But now there's so much. One of the things that I do, I look at I look at milestones, and I, I, I like to look at numbers, and look at things that certain people have started, but but how many times do they fall off before this happens, or before that happens? So with podcasting, it's perfect because they the numbers say, if this is still accurate, at one point the numbers said that I believe it's eighty or ninety percent of all podcasts end before the tenth episode, like they give up before the tenth episode or something. So when I started my new one back now, which, which you know, I, I started doing a podcast back then, but when I got into music and acting, I had already abandoned the podcast. But we were well over 10 episodes back then. But now we were 30 episodes into our new podcast, which is called the Marty Ray Project Chats for anyone that would want to hear it. But uh, what we did, though, because I knew that number, I recorded 10 episodes before releasing the first one. So I said, I'll make sure that I beat that milestone before I even start this thing. So it's the same way with anything. With music, I looked at, well, the first thing that I can do that most people don't do is they don't get 50,000 views. I got 30 a long time ago. So I said, if I can get 50,000, then I've, I've, I've accomplished something. As long as you keep telling yourself and keep making milestones that you, and you feel like you're, you're winning, 
That's all you got to do. That's all you're supposed to do. And then, of course, my trust is always in the Lord. So after 50, it was 100,000. After 100,000, it was a million. After a million, it was two million and so on and so forth. It was and that still goes that way. After in this day and age of my life, I, I'm still not I don't have any advantages, any secrets uh, to navigate the algorithms other than I do. I, I will tell you this, that the reason that that my music ended up getting such a broad spread out, outside of just the fact that it was divine, it was a, it was a supernatural thing. But little did I know that because I answered all my comments, every Every comment that a fan left, every message that they sent, I answered that those back. I had to. I felt like these are the people that are lifting me up when nobody else would. Nobody else besides B.B. King and Charlie Daniels and people like this, but these people are now lifting me up. My own family wouldn't. My own friends didn't, but these people are. And I'm going to make sure that I let them know I love them to death. And so I did that. I answered every single comment. I still try to answer every one that comes in. It's impossible now for me to answer every single one unless that's all I did all day long forever. But I, I do still answer. I I believe probably 80% of my own comments right back. And uh, like a lot of my fans, they'll tell you that I am the most personable person that they're a fan of. And some people say, well, it's because you're not as big as other artists and things like that. But, and that might be the case, but no matter how big I was to ever get, I will always do the best I can to answer every comment I can because not, not just for algorithm sake, but because I love those people and I'm thankful for them. But little did I know back then that I was, I was answering all those. And that was actually catapulting my, my, uh, reach. I didn't even know it. I was doing that because, and I don't encourage anyone to do, to answer comments just because they feel like, well, this is what I got to do to get more reach. They should answer comments just because those people took the time out to leave you a comment. So, but people do that now. It's like in strategies and whatnot. They say, well, here's a strategy, answer all your comments. But I say the strategy should be love on your fans and let them love you back. That's kind of what I go. I don't even remember what the question was at this point. I went off on a <laughs> on a rant there. Was there no, a question? No, but that's good because I was kind of <laughs> asking you if you had like, any tips or anything but what you really said was like just be a good person and love back the people who love you and honestly that's I think right. sometimes when we're building something we do try to find like strategically what's the best way like what times do i need to post and who do i need to tag and all of that kind of thing but what you said is so good because it's like just show love to the people who show love to you and you will yep. organically gain a following just because so many of the people that we do follow it's like you never get a response from them what or you you know it's just you'll never hear from them and so i love that you said that um and i this last question i have to ask it's um so i know that you're a believer and i love that and what is it like being a believer and keeping your faith while being in the music industry well, I am in the I'm at a advantage point because I'm not really in the music industry. So they don't tell me what to do. That's why I don't sign record deals. I don't want a record be with a record label uh because I have certain morals. It was like I met with some labels back in the day and some of the things that they want you to do, they want you to tour. They want you to tour 200 dates a year or whatever and and that means you have to make a decision. Do you love music more than your family? See, I have two daughters and a wife. I'm not going to, they're not, they're more important than music, right? So if God wants me to do music, he'll make a way for me to do it without having to forget about them, without having to betray them, without having to to be away from them. So, and he has, and that's exactly what's, what has happened and continues to happen. But I understand that in, in, the music industry, there's, they're immediately asked to bend their morals, their morals. And then they, they're told like, well, you can say you, you a lot of times it's like, it is this way. They'll say, you can say God because God is universal and things like that, but don't say Jesus. But that's why I just really try to say, Jesus bless you instead of God bless you to a lot of people, just so they know that I am on Jesus's team 
And uh, they're never going to change that. And someday they're going to even bow their knees whether they want to or not. So, you know, and I could go off and start preaching, but that ain't what this is about. We're trying to <laughs> help people in their uh, business or I forget, unmute your mind. I think this is about business. This is about business. Well, I mean, it's just about telling your story in general. So oh, it's not just well, business. let me let me start preaching then. Hold on a second. Go ahead. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> but the, no, the point is, like, I never did get into this into music with the intent that I would ever. I think that's why it's so perfectly God, like God's plan is so perfect. It was so perfectly delayed to where I was able to be more mature. I already had a family. I already had a wife. I was already married when I, when I first made something, whatever it is that I might've made when I, whenever I did what I've done, it was, uh, I say, I, whatever God, whenever God put me where he's put me now, I was already mature enough to know that there's certain decisions that they won't make that I won't make for their sake to meaning, meaning, if a record label comes to me at 18 years old when I was all pretty and sexy and I look good, you know, uh, and I might have made a decision that uh, that uh, might not been good for me, might have led me to a horrible path. So God delayed it. He delayed it by, by my family and them not really pushing. I don't I think sometimes people say, man, I never had anybody pushing me. And then you but you should think back and go, well, maybe it wasn't. They weren't supposed to. Because if they pushed you, maybe they was pushing you off an edge. Maybe they were going to push you somewhere you weren't supposed to be. You were you were held back on purpose because those that trust in the Lord, right, they receive all the promises. He is not slack concerning his promise. So, And he, he wasn't in me. So I was held back for a reason. And when it did come about, I was mature enough to go, I don't need their, their – um, I won't bend my morals. I, I won't. T I won't say that God's not real. I won't. They won't drown out me talking about Jesus. They won't do it. So, but as eighteen year old, maybe they would have. I don't know. I can't tell you what would have happened then. You know. So I think yeah. that the most important thing is that. And I think I love that you said that. Like you were not willing to bend your morals and you knew like the reason why you are who you are and you've had the success that you've had thus far has been from Jesus, from God. And you know, that. 100%. and so yes. I think that is, that's beautiful because oftentimes when people are trying to climb the ladder to the top, they can kind of forget all of that. And they're like, Oh, thanks for getting me here, God. And then, you know, it's just like, it's it's sometimes it's heartbreaking to see, but it's so refreshing to have a conversation with somebody who says like, you know, anything that you do is you get to control it. And I think that's what's beautiful. And you're still gaining success. And I'm sure you've got much more to go. But at the same time, you haven't had to sell out to get where you're at. And if as far as I'm supposed to go is right here, then it's been a great ride and a great time. And I think I've affected a lot of people. And there's been a lot of conversations and, and things that I've had in, in messages that have been truly supernatural and divine that if, if, if this is the end of what God had planned for me in music, then so be it. I'm still, I've done my job because you only have to affect one person. You know, Jesus leaves the 99 for the one. So if he only called me to reach one person through all of this and I reached them, then so be it. Now I'll go get that job at Nucor. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> thank you so much for being on my podcast. This conversation has been great and we could keep going for hours. I mean, you just started preaching, so I should I let know. you know you could have preached like this. Yeah, minutes. in closing, <laughs> we will, uh, <laughs> everybody turn to your Bibles. And, uh, no, yeah, I, I, I could, I can go on forever. So yeah, you got to definitely cut me off. I do want to say though, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Unmute your mic. What, a, what an awesome name for a show. I wish I would have thought of that. Unmute your <laughs> mic. Because that's like, that's a, that's a metaphor of life, right? Unmute your mic. Is that what that means? Yeah, really just, and it's allowing people to speak up about the things that they normally don't want to talk about. Like yeah. I told you before, earlier on, it's like a lot of times 
we see people get to this finished product and we're like, oh, what a perfect life and how I'm so jealous or, you know, but mm-hmm. you don't really get to hear the behind the scenes. And then there are oftentimes things that we feel like we shouldn't talk about or we don't want to talk about God or Jesus because they want to put us in a box and you don't want to be a Christian artist or a Christian podcaster. So mm-hmm. um, it right. really is just a metaphor to speak up and, and say what you need to say and say it boldly and loudly. Exactly. Thank you. Hey, let me say real quick to anybody that's listening, please go check out our podcast and you as well, Jessica, the Marty Ray Project chats. And then you can find all my information at martyrayproject.com with regarding music and join the mailing list there, please. And you'll be notified with all shows and, and updates like that. And I just want to thank you again. I'm definitely going to join listen, subscribe to everything you have. I appreciate you being on my platform today. And like he said, please stay connected with him, his music, his podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Unmute Your Mic. I'm your host, Jessica Bell. We had Marty Ray Project on today, and I want to thank you all. We'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to Unmute Your Mic. Be sure to tune in next time when Jessica takes her mic off mute as she continues her journey to find stories that inspire and uplift our communities.